right. YouTube saying I'm live. So hello, welcome. Um, thanks for joining. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, if anything's up, let me know. Uh, if there's anything wrong with the audio or video, just uh, throw it in the chat. And um, yeah, other than that, I guess we could pretty much get started. Uh, cool. <laughs> Let's get switch over to my, my screen here. There we go. Uh, so how did I get 256 gigabytes of RAM? I bought it. I don't know. <laughs> Made sure I, I could max it out, I guess. Um, so hello, everybody. What I'll be doing today, and I should have prepared this, obviously, that would have been a better idea, uh, is try and make something similar to something I did recently. And when I posted it, people seemed pretty excited about it. Um, so it's something I created recently for a uh, sort of a masterclass at my college where I used to um, used to work not work, where I used to study. And every year, um, for the past few years, I've gone back and held a class. And we did this in roughly two hours. So I figured um, this would be a fun exercise to do online. Um, I'm not going to replicate it exactly, but I'm going to use some of the same techniques and things. And um, just kind of try and have fun with it to show you a bit of a process more than anything else. Um, so yeah. So I'll try and answer some questions uh, every now and then. I'm not going to constantly go back and forth because I need to kind of, uh, yeah, stay focused, I guess. Um, but I will jump in every now and then and answer a few questions. All right, so just got Blender 3.0 right now. And um, the plugin I'll be using to create uh, the human model is called MB Lab. Um, you can see it here it's mblab.dev is the um, the website. So if you want to use the same the same thing, you could. Um, I'm just going to use it very quickly to generate a mesh, and then all the fun stuff is kind of going to go from there. So let's see. Um, I'm just going to create a. I don't know. Just pick something randomly. Um, let's say Afro male. And use cycles, that's fine. Create the character. And then I'll be able to change it up a little bit with everything that's going on. So hello, everybody joining. Thank you for joining. Um, so generally, what I'll do is I'll go into the random generator. And then I'll keep the fantasy bit. Uh, and I might set the engine to realistic. And that way, it's not going to turn it into an elf or anything. Um, but you can kind of, yeah, control it by saying what, what you want to preserve. So for me, I don't really care. I'm just going to hit generate a couple times. Let's see till we get a face that's slightly different. That might be interesting. I'm just kind of looking at head shapes to see if something kind of pops up. Um, obviously, we'll start from the, the base um, sort of phenotype, as they call it. Oh, that's pretty interesting. Let's see, just gonna keep generating different ones. Kinda I quite like that face. Maybe just a little bit more. Just trying to look for something as I'm spinning around, kinda looking at an interesting um sort of face shape. I really like this one. Feels kind of expressive. Alright, cool. So with that done, I don't really do much else. I just go straight to the finalize tools. I turn off save images and backup character. I don't really care about it. I'm just going to hit finalize because the next step is just posing it. And because we're doing um, this, uh, I guess, yeah, what was I going to say? Um, just sort of a headshot. We can get rid of a lot of the mesh uh, while we're creating it. So it's kind of fun. So once that's done, We'll go into pose mode and I'm just going to bring down the arms a little bit so the shoulders look a little bit more normal. And from here, I'm going to change two things. I'm going to look into maybe setting an expression and just looking at how the head is 
kind of pointing. Maybe we could have it point to the side. And I'm just already looking for like an interesting camera perspective. So you now it looks cool. So let's add a camera. And again, um, as this is a demo, I'm not going to spend crazy amounts of time refining. I just kind of know what I want to do and go from there. So let's see. This looks visually interesting. So let's turn up the passport two on the camera. So that's kind of an interesting shot. We'll see with lighting and everything, how much it changes, but it's good to know that this works. Um, let's have a look at some of the expressions. Do an angry expression. I'm not feeling that angry today. So let's see if we can do something different. Give him a bit of a grin. It's a little bit over the top. I generally actually like a fairly, um, I guess a neutral, uh, neutral look. So we'll see. We don't necessarily have to do anything. Make him annoyed. Ugh. <laughs> you could have way too much fun with this stuff. Actually, I'm just going to leave it the way it is. I kind of like the, the neutrality of it. That way the, the mesh can do the talking rather than the expression. So... Before I go any further, I'm going to save this file, go down to my projects, and let's see. I had a little demo folder here. I've got demo02 going, and let's call this demo02. So next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually just going to export this mesh to an OBJ. And the reason I do this, if you try to convert it to a mesh, it won't work because it has shape keys. And if you try to apply the modifiers, it also, it leaves all this stuff in here, all the vertex groups and everything that I'm not going to use anyway. And I found just the quickest way to get a clean mesh. Um, so I'm going to limit to my selection. I'm going to turn off materials is just to export it very quickly. And then I can keep this rigged character uh, in the scene. And if I want to change it, I can always go back. And now I have something that I can always just bring in um, and not have to mess with. So before we start going crazy, I want to optimize this mesh a little bit so we're not doing any unnecessary calculations. So I'm just going to cut off a uh, part here. Uh, and I'm going to leave a little bit more than, what, than what's visible in the camera just in case we want to change our um, camera angle after the fact. There we go, faces, and then what I want to keep is this. And because the mouth is closed, I don't necessarily want to keep any of the other insides, like the teeth and all that stuff. So I'm just going to keep the outer layers of the mesh. So invert this, delete the faces. And that way, when I'm doing stuff with modifiers, it's not going to take very long. Um, so I'm just going to grid fill this, give it some kind of decent sort of looking fill. There we go. And it's just easier that these are um, that these are quads. Otherwise, you could just fill it if you wanted to, but generally it's just a little bit easier that they're quads, if, especially if you're going to throw on a subdivision surface modifier at some point, it'll be faster. So I leave that a span of six, so they're quite similar. There we go. And now I have a really good base mesh to start from. I'm going to give this a name, call this object dude.000. And then I'm going to copy it a few times because I'm going to do multiple layers of effects. Um, I'm going to follow sort of the similar similar way, um, sort of similar idea that I did before. And basically I have three layers, one on the inside and then a one with really small detail on the outside and one with larger lines on the outside. So let's start with the lines on the outside um, and work our way. Uh, or actually, let's do it from the inside out. So let's start with the inside mesh. So for this one, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to delete the eyes because I'm not going to use those. And then we can look at our face orientation. So I'm just going to flip the normals and that way they're pointing inwards. And the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to add some hair onto this just to get like a whole bunch of cool sort of inner looking interesting things. And let's see, I'm going to turn off the emitter in the viewport and in the render because I really just want the inside. And then I'm going to definitely turn down the hair length to something a bit more, a bit less crazy maybe. 
I'm going to turn up the strand steps in the render and um, that way when we start applying forces to them they'll they'll have enough steps to kind of do crazy stuff so so let's add in turbulence force and as you can see immediately it affects the hair which is kind of interesting and we can mess with the size a little bit to get some more interesting looking things and then um, what we can do as well is I'm going to add another object, just a very simple object, like a cylinder in here. And I'm going to use that to sort of attract all the hairs inwards. Um, I could convert this to something like geometry nodes and then use like a raycast node and all that kind of stuff to, to get it to work. But I like generally fairly simple uh, solutions, and this tends to work pretty well. Because um, we can set it to non-renderable, and because it's inside the face, it'll look interesting. So um, to do that, we're going to add a force field and set the force to surface. And what that's going to do is it's actually going to use the surface of the mesh to project forces in and out. And what we want to do is now set this in a negative value, and then it's going to pull a lot of those hairs back in. So we have them wrapping around that force, but they're being generated from the... Um, from the mesh itself. And then we could always move the turbulence force up and around um, to get something that works with what we're doing. So we might have to move this back a bit uh, depending on when we start doing the meshes. But in the original example that I showed earlier, you'll see that, I don't know if it's still open now. Um, you know, if you look closely, some of these stick out and we can mess with these as we, as we move along. So with that done, um, let's see, I'll, add the second layer. And here we can see where they stick out and maybe we could um, bring these a little bit in, a little bit more. And now you can see, have all these strands moving along, maybe even just make this cylinder a little bit longer. That way you can mess with it again. And it's just a case of playing with all this stuff. Um, if you want even more variation, what you could do is just duplicate that turbulence, set it to be even smaller. And now you're going to get like a second layer of turbulence on top of the other one. Um, maybe bring the strength down a little bit. And this is going to break it up even more. You see the pattern becomes more erratic. Uh, and then we'll have to, because there's more turbulence forces, we'll have to go to the cylinder and then bring that back in a little bit. Again, it's just a case of messing with this stuff. And I'm just going to grab these. And with that second mesh, we can look around until we get something that looks kind of interesting. So I like that it sort of creeps around his face here. So this, this might look cool because we've got these hairs kind of creeping up around the side of the face. And again, I don't really have any strict plan. I have a, a number of techniques that I know I'll be using, but I don't really... Uh, have a strict plan of the end result. So let's call this force.turb.big. Yeah, sorry, you can't see that. Well, I'm just renaming my objects. Um, so I'm planning on, yeah, if it looks any good, well, if, even if it doesn't, but I'll, I'll release the file as well in the description later on so people can download it and look at it. So this is the small turbulence. Yes. And then this is the, uh, what's it called? The force, I'll call it force pull. And then we can put those in a collection and call them forces. And then uh, before I start the second part, I'll start answering some questions. So let's see, I see a lot of people saying hello. Um, mm -mm. so any tips on making a low poly, poly city fast, no textures or anything, just geometry, uh, geometry nodes, look at, um, BBBN 19's tutorials, uh, on stuff like recursive subdivision, you could do a really interesting city blocky thing very quickly. Uh, honestly, if you just look for, um, what was I going to say? Uh, recursive subdivision and geometry nodes. You'll get a bunch of interesting starting points, and then I would go from there. So cool. So a lot of people saying hello. Uh, do I use Topaz Studio for post processing? No. Um, that's the AI upscaling thing, if I'm correct. I don't really use it. Um, 
Yeah, I did it recently on a project. I used AI upscaling, but I used the one that's built into DaVinci Resolve because that's the editing program I use and it has it built in. So, um, yeah. Other than that, though, I've, I know of Topaz, but I've never used it myself. So let's add some more hairs into the mix just to get sort of more layers. Now, 25,000, this is going to slow everything down. You can see it gets pretty slow if you go kind of nuts with it, but that's cool. I like this. So generally when I'm working on something like this, I'd, I'd like to have the final, well, not even the final look, but just to have the image itself open at all times. That way I can just peek at my end result and I can keep working on stuff here. So I'm gonna turn on the wireframes, set the opacity to maybe 25%. So I just have a reference of what's going on. So for the first sort of um, layer, which is, I guess, the fine detail layer, we'll do it in reverse. Instead of doing the really big things first, we'll do the fine details first. Um, I kind of tend to work backwards. So what I'll do is I'll add a subdivision surface. I'm just going to turn off optimal display so we can see all the subdivisions. Let me bring it down to three. It's a bit much maybe, but we'll see. We can always mess with it later. And then I'm gonna create a vertex group um, with a texture. So this is a trick I've used many times. Uh, if you've been here, you've seen me use this before. So first I'll make an empty vertex group, call it mask. And then in the weight paint node, you'll see that as I select this in the vertex weight edit modifier, and I put this after the subdivision so it has more polygons to work with, so it's a lot um, smaller. Um, smaller and it has like more detail and stuff. I'm going to turn on group add, I'm going to invert the fall off. So basically all you're doing right now is just telling Blender, okay, I want you to fill up this uh, vertex weight um, by just flipping it. And then if we add a texture to this, we could add something like a distorted noise. Uh, and then you'll see it kind of fills it up um, dynamically and we can mess with it. So I like to use the cell noise is my favorite. Uh, yeah, like if, if you watched this before, you'll know why. Um, so going into object mode, it's a little bit big, but I want to squish it down so it has a more interesting pattern. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to create an empty. And I'm just going to scale it down, maybe on the Z axis, maybe to 0.2. So that way it's squished down on the Z axis, but it's um, it's actually sort of normal size, I guess. Uh, on the other axes, sorry, I'm a little bit tired. <laughs> I planned this yesterday and uh, I didn't realize I was gonna be this tired today. So taking it easy. Um, so in texture coordinates, what I'll do is I'll select the object and select that empty. Basically now I can use that empty to control how the texture is projected. So by squishing it down, I'm getting this sort of like glitchy distorted pattern, which looks interesting. And then I can just bring the, the size down in here while looking at it. And the reason I want this is now what I want to do is I want to start by um, decimating this down. So if you just collapse it down, what you'll see is, um, there we go. I don't know, is there another one visible somehow? No, oh, the other one's still visible. I don't know why that is. I turned off show emitter. It's weird. I'm just gonna turn it off for now so we can focus on this. I'm gonna turn up the wireframe opacity a little bit so it's a bit more visible. So now you see, just by decimating this, uh, we get, yeah, just like a triangulated mesh because we're decimating, if I turn it off, we're decimating this uh, subdivision, subdivided version down. Now what we could do is just by turning this back on, and this takes a little while, and selecting the mask, it's only gonna decimate uh, according to the mask that I just created. So now you can see stuff is starting to get way more interesting. And as we mess with like the contrast and the saturation or the brightness of this mask, um, you'll see I get more of this detail all over the place. And this one is just a case of then messing with the ratio. So if I bring the ratio to maybe 0.25, you start seeing all these different patterns showing up, hopefully. 
And this is something you could tweak for a very long time, obviously. So it's 3.4. And we might have to go back and tweak the texture a little bit. So this feels like it needs more contrast, maybe. And we'll bring up the brightness, see how that affects it. There we go. Not quite getting the desired effect, but we'll get there. It's a lot of experimentation and things like that, obviously. Um, let's go to point 0.6. And I'm just looking at the patterning on the face. So this is starting to get interesting. Um, I want to have a little bit more detail in there. So I'm going to bring the size of that texture down again, just to see how that affects it. And there we go. It's starting to get kind of cool. We could even scale down the empty even more. So I'm just going to scale it on the Z axis half again. So it's about a 10th as high as it is wide. Let's hit enter, this takes a second. And now you can see this is starting to get kind of wild. So that's what I'm aiming for. And again, let's bring up the brightness to see what that does. It's all just about massaging these values. Bring down the contrast. Do I get more? Because I want as many. Yeah, not really, but let's see. So it looks kind of cool. Um, so now we've got this pattern, and I want to augment it just a little bit more. So I'm going to add another decimate on top. Um, and I really like starting from a really high poly mesh and then destroying it down. And I think this will be nice enough. Um, but rather than using collapse, I'm going to use planar. And what planar does, it's going to use the angles of the, the polygons to try and decimate. But when you set this to like a really low value to like 0. Point, yeah, I put in 0. 0.25. I think it's 0. 0.25. Um, because there's so many polygons, you get sort of like a little bit of extra, I guess, smushiness through to it. I don't know how to explain it. Because um, it starts at such a low angle, it's only in certain parts of the mesh that it really affects it. So we're just bringing this down. And really what we're doing is we're just going to create a mesh pattern that looks as intricate as possible. Uh, there we go. That looks kind of cool. And then it's time for our MVP, the wireframe modifier. So let's see, and this always explodes uh, until you turn off even on a mesh like this, and then it'll start showing up. Um, and then the reason this looks really weird is because the thickness is absolutely insane. So let's bring that down. Come on, there we go. We're getting closer to something interesting. And the reason these values are so small is because we're working at human scale. So the face is going to be like, you know, what, 20, 30 centimeters, something like that. So we need, um, yeah, thickness that's really, really low to kind of make that work. But in general, I can bring it down even more if I wanted to. Let's see. But I might switch over to a different, uh, different technique in the wireframe. Maybe there's still issues around the eyes here. Um, so let's see if we can bring those down even more. So again, just scaling them down, scaling them down. And I want to make sure my um, pull force here is, I'm going to leave the visibility. Let's see, I'm going to set this to viewport display to wire. I'm going to make sure it cannot render at all. Um, that way I know it's there, but it's never going to render and I don't have to deal with like transparent materials or anything like that. Um, there we go. There's still some clipping here and there that I can see, but we'll see. This might catch the light in an interesting way. Um, so with that one done, if we turn on our uh, wires again, we can start a render already. See how, uh, how this goes. Move up the area light. That's looking kind of wild. So our hair is really, really big. That's okay. We can fix that later. So I'm just putting in one single area light. 
Actually, let me reset the rotation, bring it down a little bit, move it forward. And this is a good way of looking at it objectively. So um, yeah, what you're seeing here is that the hair is absolutely massive. And um, one thing I might do differently is maybe bring it into geometry nodes after all. Uh, but we'll explore it the way it is first and then kind of go from there. Because um, the hair is really cool, but it also has its limitations. Um, yeah, I'll actually I'll fix that first. So really all it is, is under hair shape, um, we have our strand shape, uh, basically of our size of our hair strands. And I'm gonna bring down the root size a lot smaller. And now we're gonna get a lot finer hair, which is nice. Bring it down to 0 0.05. Uh, it's starting to look interesting. We can go from there. We can always add in more if we wanted to. Um, the only disadvantage that hair really has is that the bottom of the hair, so if you set it back to one, just so I can show you, you kind of see here, for example, how it's just like an open cylinder at the bottom of it. So that's why you could convert this to uh, something you could use in geometry nodes, and then you can get a cleaner, cleaner mesh out of it. Um, so, but for now, let's just leave it as hair and then we can, we can move on from there. Um, maybe just a little bit thicker to keep it interesting. There we go. So with that done, let's go back out of our render and let's add the final layer to this. And with this one, we could go pretty crazy, but honestly, um, I generally use once again, the decimate and just set this to planar. And if I just isolate this, I want the slightly bigger um, sort of lines all over. So I'm going to leave the angle limit a little bit higher and set the wireframe up here. There we go. And for this one, obviously we're going to turn off the even thickness so it doesn't blow up and then set this to relative. And then let's look at the thickness here. Maybe something like this. Let's do 0.420 just for shits and giggles. And you can see how this is starting to form the basis of the image. So we have all this big detail uh, we can even bring this down. So we have just a little bit going in here. And there's some stuff we could do to us. So um, for example, the all boundaries is interesting. Uh, that way it's going to delimit. Well, delimit is a weird word to use. Um, so basically what it's going to do, it's not going to try and keep the original um, polygons that were there. It's just going to destroy those as well. And you get more of a polygonal shape. I kind of like this one because it has a bit more going for it. And you keep sort of the original polygons. And you'll see that the flow of the polygons of the layer behind it sort of follows that. And it makes for a more interesting pattern. But again, this is all subjective. It's all taste. So that's up to you guys what you want to do with it. Um, and then one of the things you could do is you could add a smooth modifier before the wireframe. And then if you smooth it out a little bit more, you can get these almost organic looking lines, but your mesh will become a bit smaller. So you'll see how it sort of disappears in the nose a little bit, but it does look a bit more interesting. It gives a bit more of an organic feel. So you can leave that on there and we can toggle it on and off as we were trying stuff, but I kind of like the way it looks. And then if you're really, um, I'm just going to hit save before I do that. Uh, if you're really feeling adventurous, you could add a subdivision surface to this, but I'm going to turn off the render. This usually tends to take a while with a mesh like this. Unfortunately, it's uh, it's not very well optimized for weird meshes. So, and then you'll see it just smooths that out. Um, generally, I'll just kind of leave this off in the viewport uh, unless unless I need to see it. But one of the things we could do, so you'll see, because we're smoothing this all out and subdividing it down, for example, the tip of the nose here, what we're running into is that it's actually disappearing into the other mesh. So very simple trick just to get that to push back out. And this is why looking at being able to look at your, um, your final mesh is so important because you can see the relationship of all the different elements you're, you're creating really beautifully. Um, one of the things I like to do is before it turns into a wireframe, so when it's an actual like proper mesh, I guess, if you want to call it that, you could add a displace modifier. And if you just leave it set to default, you set the mid-level to zero. And then really all this is, is just like kind of a push node. So if I bring this in and just push it out a very tiny little bit, so maybe 0.05, there we go. You can see how it just pushes that mesh out in front of the other one. 
and it's very subtle. And if you look closely, sure, you might see some artifacts here or there. So I bring this down, but really all I'm doing is just, I'm trying to combat the subdivision surface, um, flattening this down and making it smaller. So it's just always thinking about how you can use some of these techniques. And let's make this a little bit bigger because the subdivision surface makes the, sort of the divisions a little bit smaller. And let's see what happens when you turn off our smooth. That looks really cool now that we turned our smooth off again. Um, we have those sort of edges that are still there, but the subdivision surface is kind of toning them in or toning them down a little bit, bringing them in a little bit. Um, now we get kind of an interesting look. So again, you know, don't be afraid to destroy a mesh to see what happens. Generally, a lot of fun stuff really, really tends to happen. So the only thing I'm a little bit worried about is that there's not a lot going on up here. So what we could do is just add in another mesh, maybe like, uh, yeah, I tend to add in a cube when I want to try and make a circle, just because I know if I add a subdivision to it, um, that's going to work. And I'm just going to scale it down all the way down. And I want to add another source of that hair in here. And because I've already set up these, um, these systems, the cool thing is I can just steal it from the other one. So I'd grab the particle settings here and now you'll see the hair. And one of the things we're running into here is that it's not really going all over the place. Uh, let's see. So the cylinder might be the problem. So the pull force, I'm gonna bring that back down. Uh, let me just set this to zero for a sec to see what happens. So now we've got the hair going everywhere, but that's not really what we want. Okay, so I'm going to leave it at what it was, and I'm going to use this cool trick that you can use. Um, so forces main, and I'm going to call this, I'm going to add in a second collection. I'm going to call this forces, uh, what do we call it? Head, brain, it's called brain. It's cooler. And if I add a force just in there, what you can do is you can then set up so let's see, because I want to have the hair. Where are we? So this first one, I want to make sure that I've duplicated the particle system, because right now these two are still linked. So I'm going to duplicate this one. That way I have a separate one, but I don't have to set up all the hair again, which is quite nice, obviously. And uh, one of the things I want to do is make sure that in the first one, so this is object dude zero, in the field weights, basically what you can tell it is, I only want you to use um, forces in a certain collection. So if we set this one now to forces main, then we'll see it show up and it's not gonna be affected by any new forces that I throw into this forces brain. So if I add in a, and I'm just gonna turn off the render here to keep things a little bit faster. If I add in a turbulence force now to that one, I'm just gonna move it up. So generally I'll move these forces up to sort of where they, they're they being used. The cool thing is in my little cube that has the hair on it, and I'm gonna scale this back down. So I'm just gonna look at this separately. Now what I can do is tell this one, okay, I only want you to use the forces brain. And that way it's unaffected by the other one and we have way more control over this one. So I'll call this force turbulence brain. And we can have multiple systems playing off different forces and we don't have to do too much other stuff. So it's pretty cool. And then we can mess with the size a little bit, mess with the strength. Let's see. The main problem here is that it's sort of going all over the place or like it's sticking to one side because of the size of the emitter. So I might want to change that up a little bit more. And let's duplicate this one again. So the more forces we have, uh, I don't think it's in my viewport. There we go, let's select it, duplicate it again. So let's, yeah, let's just leave it at brain zero, zero, 001 and then grab those two in the cube and isolate them. And I keep looking at the, the render or the, the final bit here as well to make sure that it is an interesting thing after all, so that it's not doing too many crazy things. So bring the size down again. Let's see. And yeah, we sort of just want to fill it up in an interesting way. 
have it kind of go all over. And I think my forces are pretty extreme. There we go. So this is starting to look cool. I like that. And then what I'm going to do is just to tone that down because I really like sort of the inside of this, the way it's filling up the, the head here. I'm just going to move this back a little bit, maybe move it up a little bit, and then just play with the hair length until it's mostly in there. And then I can grab those two turbulence forces and then just move them around until the brain pan sort of fills up and maybe move it back a little bit until we don't have too many weird things sticking out. So that might work, maybe not. Again, it's just a case of setting this up and then moving it around. That's kind of cool that it comes out, but it doesn't translate very well in the image. Well, this might look interesting. You have some stuff going off to the right there that can look kind of nice. Yeah, so you can see now I filled it up and there's more going on. So with that hair set up, I think one of the things I want to do is apply my scale here to make sure, there we go. So now you can see the hair got a little bit thicker because the scale of the original object wasn't, uh, wasn't reset. But this looks kind of cool. I think I'm going to go from here. The amount of hair here is pretty high, but that's fine. I don't mind that at all. Um, so yeah, rather than rendering this with hair, what, what I did with the previous one, um, I'm going to actually bring these two into geometry nodes and um, have a little bit more control over the mesh that it generates. So uh, before that, let's see if there's any more questions. Um, so you didn't know MB Lab had expressions? Yeah, it has all kinds of stuff and it. it's pretty cool. Does it bake its shape keys and then you can interpolate between the expressions later? Yeah, basically it has a whole bunch of shape keys in there for moving all the different parts of the face and you can just animate those and do like a face animation. So um, you can also give a breakdown of another artwork where the grills are coming out of the dude's face. Oh, that one's cool, but I, yeah, we'll see um, how long this takes. Um, Maybe in the next stream, maybe I'll, I'll keep that for a separate one because I really wanted to focus this one on just making something from scratch. And I don't know how long it's going to take. Um, but I'm I'm not against showing it. Don't get me wrong. I'd be happy to show it, but maybe we'll we'll do one next stream. That could be fun. Um, do, do, do. So let's see. Can you give us an example of your payback money you have from these works? Do you sell these works? Um, yeah, the, some of these are, are um, available for sale. Um, the money, I don't, I started off selling them for like a single one for a lot of money, but now it's it's a lot, yeah, a lot less. I'll do like editions of 25 or 100 at like a few euros. Um, I find that one a little bit more fun. So, but yeah, uh, there's not that many um, more questions. Just one last one. How far can we take our renders in Eevee? Is it possible to render these out via Unreal? It's all meshes. You could bring those all out in Unreal. You could render them all out in Eevee. Should work fine. Um, yeah, I don't see why that wouldn't work. Um, all right, so let's keep the show on the road. Now, what I want to do is I want to convert these to a mesh. And um, when you create a hair particle system, there's this really great button in the modifiers tab that's convert to mesh. So when I click that, I can now hide I'm going to put this in my scene collection and I can now hide the, and let's call this particle or hair dot brain. And let's call the other one object dude. That's fine. Um, so it created this mesh. So now I could turn off the hair brain mesh. And actually let's throw that in there. I'm going to, disable that collection. Whenever I don't need anything, I tend to disable it. So and I'm going to convert to mesh the other one as well. And then I can just turn off the um, the object itself because we don't need it anymore. And I'm going to turn off the main forces collection in there as well and throw the dude object in there too. So now I have these two and they're basically meshes. As you can see, uh, if I go to thing here. Um, and I could even do some copying pasting if I wanted to. But now these two are meshes, which means we could start using them in geometry nodes. I'm just going to collapse these out together. So I'm going to join them. And I'm going to call this object dot strands. And let's do some basic geometry node stuff on there. 
just so everybody can follow along. So now these are just strands and obviously they're not gonna render because they're just edges. So if we add a geometry nodes modifier to this, and what we can do is we have that as a mesh and then we're gonna, what is that mesh to curve? There we go. And now basically what we've done is we've changed these from a mesh to a curve. And if we go back from a curve to a mesh then, now we can add in a profile curve to give this thickness, which is really nice. So let's have a look here and I want a curve circle. Before you plug this in, always make sure to bring the resolution down because it's gonna take a little while, uh, even like this. And you'll see my viewport absolutely explodes and that, that's because the radius is really big. Now, rather than set this radius here, um, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set the curve radius separately so under curve, we have set curve radius over here. And then what I can do is I can set this lower, for example, and now you get these cool curvy bits. Um, the fun thing is we can fill caps as well. So right now these are three, we could set the resolution to something like six, so they're a bit more round. Um, and we could play with the radius, but what I like to do as well, I think it's under, is it under input or is it under curve? There's this one called curve parameter. And really what it's giving you is just a value from zero to one along the um, length of the curve. So if I plug this in, again, this is gonna get huge because it's gonna start small and the curve is gonna sort of get bigger towards the end. But if I then uh, use a map range node or rather, let's see, I'm gonna use a multiply node first just to bring this down. So utilities, math, and setting this to multiply. Really all I'm gonna do is basically set the curve radius a lot smaller. Now you'll see they start small or they end small one or the other. Um, I always forget what it does, but I wanna get rid of these sort of nasty ends. And the way I'm gonna do that is between that factor and that multiply, I'm gonna add in a color ramp or we could do a float curve as well. I don't use it as much, but you could do the same thing with a color ramp. Um, let's see, I don't know where it is. So let's float curve. And like this, what we could do is now we could set up a curve that goes from small to big to small. Now you'll see all the ends of the curves are nicely stitched together. And we don't really have that feeling of these curves that look kind of weird. So there we go. And now that it's just a mesh, we can render it any way we want. So this looks kind of cool. And then we have this multiply value here to kind of do the overall multiplication um, as we like it. So let's see. I think we were ready to start playing around with shading at this point. So let's just keep on working on the hair. Go to material, we'll set material, and this will allow me to just add or assign a material to the geometry nodes. It doesn't always work um, if you're working with, what was I gonna say? Generated geometry, it doesn't always take the, the material that's on it, so you have to set it in the node tree. I generally, um, I generally, let's see, what was I gonna say? Uh, set, put the material on the object nonetheless, because it makes it easier to edit it uh, when you're switching editors and stuff like that. So let's call this strands. And then uh, make sure we set this to strands. There we go. And then we can move over to our shader editor. So let me just get this object by itself, maybe with the light. So there we go. And I want the camera. I don't want the camera, that's fine. Where is the area light? There we go. I'm just going to grab both of those and look at the strands themselves. Um, the annoying part of doing it with geometry nodes is that now I can't change the mesh dynamically anymore. Um, when you leave it as hair, you can still mess with the, um, what you would call it, with the forces and stuff and see it happen and change in real time with all your shaders applied to it. In my case, it doesn't really matter. Um, it's no big deal. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna grab the geometry node from the input section in the shader editor. And there's this lovely little random per island. So if I go down, 
we'll see. And this always takes a second because it has to calculate the pointiness. There we go. Now it's going to give each one of those strands because they're separate mesh islands a value from zero to one. And then I can easily mess with that and add some color into it and use it for all kinds of stuff. So I tend to use the color ramp. Um, I set this to constant and that way I can mix different shaders together. So let's say we'll go for something like quite metallic has a lot of reflections in it. And we want to offset that with some color with something else just to get more going. So what we could do is plug this into the mix shader and you can see because I set this to constant, it acts like a mask. I can just kind of look at a kind of almost a percentage of stuff that needs to look different. Throw that in here. I'm going to actually leave that here and I'm going to add in a new principled BSDF. Throw that in there. And now I can add some color into it. So let's see what color am I feeling today? This kind of looks like sports shoe green. Let's go for something a little wild. See how that works out. We can always change it if we want to and bring up a lot of roughness. Let's see if we bring up the subsurface and then set the radius to the same thing because by default it's set to um, kind of use it for skin. Now, if you get these weird issues, it's because there's geometry clipping through one another and then the subsurface tends to freak out a little bit, doesn't always want to, doesn't always know what to do. Setting this back to the older method, the Christensen Burley method, generally fixes this. It's not quite as precise, but I find that it gives really interesting results. So, so we get an interesting sort of both, yeah, very machine and organic look at once. It's almost like rubber or something, some kind of plastic, maybe even. So with that set up, we can move on to the other ones. And again, this is just the inside. So you'll see now, really, it's just giving me a little bit of extra here and there. Um, so we went through all this work, but it, it is important because I, I tend to render a lot of this stuff really large. And then when you want when you zoom in, you definitely want a lot of that extra detail in there. Um, so I, I print these really big and stuff as well. It's really nice. So let me just give this a name, this light, uh, and I'm just giving everything names. So don't worry about it too much. Um, this is the control for the mask. Um, so yeah, so let's then do the second part, which I believe are the smaller strands. And I'm just going to copy this material, it's a default material. So that makes it a lot easier to copy over. Let's set this to metallic and I really like metallic shaders. Um, yeah, they just, there's something about them that's interesting. Here you can see, um, because I'm setting the roughness fairly low, it picks up and highlights that light really nicely and just adds so much to the overall image, so much like density and a layered feel to it. And it's cool because I want to be somewhere between like this very ethereal feeling thing and at the same time almost feeling kind of solid so that definitely helps i might switch it over to something else in a little bit though um yeah and then for the outer one because this is so big uh what we want to do is we want to make sure that there's some detail in the shader as well so let's see again bringing this down to metallic maybe making this one a little bit darker so it contrasts everything so here you can see how it brings out everything else you can maybe get it to yeah so here you'll see sort of the limitations of the mesh a little bit and stuff like this can be solved by by setting up the render subdivisions a little bit higher um, it'll take a little while to calculate and depending on the ram on your GPU, it might or might not work and you might have to tone it down a little bit, but it's just to fix those reflections here. But yeah, there's still a lot we haven't added yet. So um, I'm going to keep this simple. And the idea of this exercise is just to kind of get your brain going and um, and play with things and, and experiment. So uh, I'm going to use a Musgrave texture because I really like those and set this to object scale it down quite a bit. There we go. Set up the lacunarity. At least that's how I think you say that and bring up the detail. And now we get this sort of very patchy looking 
mesh, but I want to do more with it than just that. Uh, so it's just the outside. I don't want something that's a bit more swirly and interesting. So we could mix uh, multiple textures together. And um, I have a wave texture here. And uh, let's set this to rings, maybe, and distort them. We have more rings. We'll see how, how this goes. A bit more detail in there, maybe. And what I want to do is I want to have, um, yeah, basically this texture here, this wave texture. Let me plug that in here and delete that mapping node because I don't really need it. Um, I want to have it affect the other one. So with a mix RGB node, what we can do is use this second wave texture to kind of mess with the coordinates of the first one. And as you mix this in, the effect becomes more pronounced, but it, it's a really easy way to get way more detail into your textures. So let's see, as we bring this up, you see how it becomes sort of swirly and the wave texture messes with it. I really like the way this looks. I've used this a whole bunch of times. There's no, uh, no secret trick or anything to it. So, um, it's just a lot of fun. And when we use this now, um, and the Musgrave texture has this weird habit of um, having colors that are out of bounds. So the black is sort of darker than black and the white is sort of brighter than white. That's the quickest way to describe it. I'm gonna add a map range node to this. And what that's gonna do is allow me to control the contrast in the, uh, in the, uh, the overall texture. So I'm gonna map this from something a little bit darker. So really, I'm, I'm not really doing this mathematically. I'm just doing this visually. I'm trying to look at some of the darkest spots and make sure there's like some black in it, but it's not completely dark. And then when we bring this down, I wanna make sure that in the brightest spots, there's some white, but not too much. So there we go. So now we have a nice range of contrast in that um, in that texture, which is cool. And then this one sort of just forms the basis of other stuff. So for example, what we could do is we could plug this into the base color and then we're not gonna see anything because we don't, oops, wrong keyboard button. We don't have our, um, come on, light, takes a second, there we go. And then we can already see this doing its work, but really what I wanna do is use this more as a roughness and a bump map. And um, it's gonna add a bump node, plug the height in there. And as we add this in, um, by default, it's set to one, it's kind of crazy. It's gonna look a little weird. And we see some artifacts on the edges because again, we have very little, um, very few, I guess, um, polygons. Wow, sorry, spaced there for a second. Um, and then what I want to do is maybe bring down the uh, contrast on this a little bit. There we go. Just we're just adding layers and making sure that everything sort of feels right. And maybe what I want to do is just bring this up a little bit and bring this down a little bit. Because I really like the way that darker shader sort of contrasted. And we're already getting a pretty interesting result because the bump is doing its work and it's giving us this, this fake roughness almost. And I'm just gonna bring that down a little bit because I don't wanna overdo it. And I can add a final map range node. And you can see how just by setting this one up correctly, now we have these different ones that we can use. Um, and let's say this one, I wanna set it from zero to maybe 0.25 because I don't want it too rough. And then the roughness will go along or because um, when you think about it now, it doesn't really make a lot of sense right now. Everything that's sticking out is uh, rougher, but really what you want to do is maybe do it the other way around. So all the grooves are kind of rough, maybe dirt or something has accumulated in it. So we can very easily just flip this around. So let's do 0.4 to zero. And you can see it just feels a little bit more natural, but again, all of this stuff is up to you. There's no right or wrong here. There's no, uh, no secret sauce, just playing around with it. And this kind of nicely contrasts with these really clean materials that are going on uh, in the rest of the mesh. So so one of the things I do want to do, because it does bother me that up here um, in this mesh, there's a lot of opening up here. And because the eyes are really, yeah, really tight, let's see if we can 
just change the wireframe on this. So I'm going to use the relative wireframe uh, on this one as well, just to see. And I'm going to have to push this up a lot higher. Um, just to get a more sort of, yeah, what's the best way to put this? A more aggressive look almost. Let's see. <clears throat> and this is relative to the, the, the edges size and the polygon size and all that stuff. So again, just messing around, trying stuff, having fun. It doesn't give me as much detail in the eyes as the other one. You can see if we render this, how that will affect it. But it does give me a lot more detail up here. So I might have to bump this just a little bit. So let's do 0.420, always funny. There we go. And now we have those two nicely working together. So I could add some variation on here as well, maybe um, on that shader, just to break it up a little bit more. So let's see what will we do. <clears throat> we could do, hmm, let's start with a Musgrave again. I always like the Musgrave. And just have a look. Uh, let's bring up the detail, bring down the dimension, bring up the lacunarity. We get this really dirty stuff. But let's see, let's try and take this to, to a whole other level. Let's try and kind of get the same feeling in the shader that we had in the in the mesh itself, where some parts of it are like almost have like almost digital distortion or something. So we're gonna have to distort the ever living crap out of this muff, musgrave texture. Um, I'm going to do that with brick textures, which are kind of fun. Um, the only problem with the brick texture is that it's 2D. So if we look at it, and actually this is going to work in our favor because it's being projected from the front. So this will work just fine. I'm going to bring down the mortar size and set the second color to black. So we want to make sure this goes from white to black. And then when we bring the scale down, we're going to get like these bricks all over the face. And to get more of a glitchy effect, we're going to grab another brick texture. I'm going to do the same thing that we did earlier to the to the Musgrave texture. And we're just going to mix in that second brick texture to the colors. And now you can see, as I change the second one, we get a more distorted. Um, you know, we can maybe see it better if I isolate this object. Let me select it real quick and isolate it. You can see what it's doing. And then we could even push that back into the Musgrave to see if that works at all. This by itself might work pretty well. Uh, no, there we go. And now you can see it really affects it. And as we push it, we get those bricks again. We can mess with the squash, for example, on the second one, uh, or maybe even the brick width, make the second one a little bit higher. And then it's just a case of duplicating this again, doing the same thing. So we have that one going in here, we have that one going in there, and that one going in here. And the more you layer these, the more, yeah, sort of crazy the effect is going to get. And you would definitely want to mess with these mixes a little bit. Mine's up pretty high. Oh, and just by setting this to zero, I found something interesting. But I really like the way that the, the distortion is in there as well as sort of the, the muckiness of that Musgrave. And we're going to do the same thing again. So let's see, bring this back out. And all I'm going to use this for is, again, we're sort of just sort of repeating what we did earlier. We're going to grab that map range node, and we're going to look at it and make sure that we have a nice little bit of contrast in there. Let's bring that down and there's a lot going on now. And maybe I want to make this one a little bit brighter. So again, I'm just using one to drive everything. Definitely want this brighter because I really want these to be there. But then what I could do is again, map range these back into the roughness and then maybe set the roughness to like 0.25, let's see what the original roughness was, about 0.27, so maybe about 0.3, and 
And that way we've got a lot more going on in our shader as well. When you finally zoom in, and I don't know how visual it's even gonna be at this point, but. So one of the things I'm noticing is that it's still set to shade smooth. So if we set this to shade flat real quick, we're gonna get these hard edges and it's gonna look quite a bit different. But um, what this allows us to do is to use a bevel shading node. So here it doesn't catch the light quite as nice. You can see how all the detail is gone. Um, but let's see if we can bring that back with a bevel node. And what the bevel node does basically, it allows you to create sort of a fake bevel on hard edges, but I'm gonna set this really small. And here you can see the effect as I set this smaller and smaller, you can see how it sort of, you can feel how these almost have a bevel on them just by plugging that into the normal. Now it feels like these edges are beveled. Once you get really close, you can tell that it's not correct, but now we have two things working for us where that bevel kind of breaks up the edges here. Let's see how it breaks up the edges, but we still have those flat sides catching the light as well. Um, but we'll see, I'm not 100% convinced. I might change it back to smooth. I like what it does in here, but I'm not necessarily liking what it does up there. So I'm just gonna change it back to set smooth, or shade smooth rather. Yeah, this feels a bit more balanced. So we, yeah, I'm sure we can get away with it like this. Again, if you get up close, sure, you'll see that it's not perfect, but yeah, we haven't, we're not even done adding everything to the scene yet. So that's cool. Um, so it's getting a little dark. Now, one of the things I like to do at this point is add in some volume shading. So um, as long as you're working with uh, just lights that you're placing in your scene and you're not putting in any HDRIs or a sky texture or anything like that, you can just plop it in the, um, in the world shader. There we go. And we get instant mist, makes it look cool. Just bring down the density, density a little bit. And let's, let's start playing with lighting now. Um, because right now we've just been basing everything off this one big light at the top. Let's start by lighting this one from the back just to make it a little bit more moody. So with lighting, I'm always trying to allude to things rather than just lighting everything up like crazy. Um, and what we could even do is just move this one over a little bit. I don't think we'd notice. Again, because we're looking at it from one side doesn't really matter. So I'm going to move this on the X axis. We can just mess with it a little bit. We can always reset it if we have to. But for example, I really like the way they're like sticking out there. It makes you feel like something else is going on on that side of the face that you're not, you're not seeing. So just by pushing that out a little bit, get all this extra interesting detail. And I'm just looking for a good balance between, again, alluding to something more going on. Something like that, maybe. That's yeah, worth a try. Maybe, maybe I was wrong. Let's reset the, uh, the position. Maybe it was nice the way it was, because now we get this really clean edge of the face, which we can light. So I'm just going to duplicate this light, and I point it at my dude. And now you can see we're getting some nice contrast in this image. Um, maybe set this one to disk. Move it over. Again, point it sort of towards the side of the face. Point it down a little bit, move it up. We're getting some interesting stuff. go. Um, let's see. Now let's start playing with the contrast and the look as well. I really like a very contrasty look and then kind of fight against that. And bring up the density. And we'll need one sort of final light to light up this side of the face. So we can see some of the details. So I'm just going to duplicate this one, flip it over and see if there's an interesting place we could put it. Excuse me. 
Ooh. So this is kind of cool. It's a lot brighter than it was before, but I'm not necessarily against it. Just bringing this down. Bring this in a little bit so there's more for it to reflect. And again, the more lights you bring in, the more the mist is going to light up. So we might want to bring that down again a little bit. I'm just playing with all these different things most of the time. And add some curves in here as well, because I just do all my sort of post-processing in Blender. I don't really go to a different application unless I have to. And then one of the few things we need to add to make this look a lot better is in our camera, we're going to add some depth of field. And by hitting the um, E key for eyedropper, we can just click in our viewport to get whatever we want in focus. General in, in um, photography, you want the eyes to be in focus. So let's just for the sake of it, add in an empty to focus with. That way I can move my camera around a little bit and uh, see if there's a more interesting camera point of view. And the lighting's still not quite working for me. Bring it up here. Add maybe another light, but now we're adding a lot of lights, which in general I prefer to not to have it too complex, but yeah, adding it from the top here does help. Let's see if we move this up a little bit, just to get a little bit of light in the eyes. And then one of the things we could do is go back into this main one, and then we could add a second shader onto the eyeballs. And that way we can um, have those pop out a little bit. And even if I just add something empty in there, just a very basic white shader that's going to do some interesting things because it's going to contrast with everything else. Uh, so let's go back to my node editor object, add a new one in here. And maybe we could bring that color in. Yeah, kind of works, I guess. I don't know, I feel like I'm kind of grasping at straws here. So it doesn't always work out, which is fine. Bring the roughness down, make this brighter. We could add this into the emission, maybe bring in bring down the emission strength a little bit. That was kind of fun, glowing eyes. That does look kind of interesting. It's pretty intense, but and because we have the entire eyeball still in there, it's sort of lighting up the back as well. Yeah, why not? Something different. That's cool. I like that. All right, so let's see. I'm going to set my camera here and call this cam.7 millimeters. And just see, um, generally, I'll just make a duplicate of the camera just to save it in case. And um, I'm going to set this focus object to the focus and just play around with it to see maybe there's a better, um, like I'm happy with it right now, but you never know. So just by playing around with that, just looking at it. And because the camera is now focused on the eyes, I don't have to worry about the focus. I can just look at the different parts is it focused it is not there we go and then you could you know play around with this that's the best part let me select one of these here so we can travel around them there's a lot going on so you're definitely lit to look at them from his left side but even something like this could be interesting Let's go back to our other camera, the original one. Well, that one looks kind of cool. There's a lot of negative space down here, which I'm not a huge fan of. 
But what we could do is, and let me turn off camera to view so we don't move it accidentally. Just zoom in a little bit. I had the wrong object. This is going to take forever. Let's give it a second to recover here. Um, I might actually um, answer some questions in the meantime, because I know this is going to take a second. Um, mm -mm -mm. Favorite music at the moment. I listen to all kinds of stuff. Right now, during the stream, in the background, I'm listening to Stellar Drone. I really like that. It's good uh, work music. So, um, how has my foray into NFT been? Yeah. It's interesting. Not really about it one way or the other. Um, I think it's a, a cool concept, but I think there's a lot of work still for it to kind of work as a as an entire thing. But it's it's nice. It's fun. I like the fact that I can post stuff in high resolution on those websites and people can actually get to see like a high resolution render, which is cool. So one of the things I'm going to do on the camera here is just bring the f-stop down a little bit. Not everything has to be crazy blurred out of focus all the time. Just so you get that hint of focus. It feels a bit more portraity. Um, do 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 do. So, uh, somebody else says, please don't delete the stream. The stream is gonna stay up after the thing, after the, after it's done. So it's usually immediately archived. Um, so you can start watching it after. So this is kind of nice. I don't want too much blurriness because I don't want all the hard work I put into this to disappear, obviously. But I also don't want it to overpower. Like I still want a little bit of focus on the image. So this is starting to look okay. I'm gonna add a little bit more detail. And um, at this point, I'm kind of following the, the script of what I was doing <clears throat> in the demo before. What I wanna do is add some dust particles in here. And to do that, I'm just gonna create a cube mesh. There we go. And this is going to be, let's see. Uh, just a particle system. And I'm going to set it frame start end to minus one. So this is something I've done like a million times. Make sure we're emitting from a volume. And then when you set the physics to none, this is just going to be a static particle system. So you could play the animation, nothing's going to happen. So you could really just treat it as a scattering tool, which is quite nice. I'm going to create a plane. Just let me bring that down here, make that smaller. So now the plane, I know the plane is one by one. So that makes sizing it a little bit easier, or scaling it after. Um, and then in that cube, what I want to do is make sure the emitter and the viewport display are not shown. So that way, when I render this, the, sh the cube won't be shown and we just have whatever particles are in there. And then I'm going to render this as a collection. I tend to always put my um, particles in a collection because it's just the easiest way if you put them in a collection then you can turn off the collection and then you don't have to deal with it so I'll call this particle dot dust is that the cube that I put the wrong thing in there yeah so this is the emitter dot dust let's take that out and it's the plane that I want I'm gonna call this particle dot dust and just throw it in there. And before we do anything with that particle, um, I want to give this a shader. And basically, I just want like a little gradient or something in the middle um, so that it looks cool and that it can catch the light a little bit. So let's see. Let's start with a translucent shader. And actually, let's start with a gradient texture. This can be easier. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. I hope I didn't uh, blow up somebody's headphones there. I'm just going to grab a drink real quick. There we go, bottle over there. So I want to use a spherical and I want to use the UVs. And then I'm going to offset this minus 0.5, minus 0.5. And then what we could do is just use a color ramp to bring this in. And now we've got a sphere in the middle of our texture. And the only other thing I'm going to do is 
give this a little bit more detail. Now, obviously, this is a dust moat, so you're not going to see it. It's just mostly for my head. Um, but just to show you a cool technique. Again, we're going to use a noise texture. And what we're going to do is offset the UVs. And we're just going to mix that into the mapping of the um, so color mix RGB. We're going to mix that into the mapping of the the gradient, and you'll see that way I can just kind of break it up and make it look like a dust mode. Now this is utter overkill. There's no point in doing this. Um, the only thing that we might notice if I do this in Material Preview, is as I add this, that's nah, fine. Even if I use the color version, let's add a little bit of randomness to it there. And then let's say if we have like a whole bunch of these dust motes, and I'm going to delete these in a sec, I just want to show you something. Um, then what you could do is you have the um, object info. And it's kind of like the random per island, but this one is random per object. And then if you just multiply the UV, or let's say, do a vector math, we can add that randomness to it. And basically what that's going to do is it's going to give us a random offset of the noise per dust mode. So obviously for dust mode, this doesn't matter, but it's we know it's there, so that's cool. So that way each dust mode is a little bit different and a little bit unique. So then I want to actually make a shader out of this, and I want to make sure my I'm using a mix shader here. I'm going to mix the translucent in with a transparent. And the reason I do it this way is a translucent shader catches the light really nicely and interestingly. Uh, the material preview is god awful, but if we go into rendered, and I shouldn't have done that because I just want to delete the other dust modes first. What that's going to do, and I'm going to make it not completely white, but just under white, so it's a little bit transparent. It's going to make them very soft and subtle. The way dust motes are, they generally only catch the light when it's shining directly on it, like in a normal room when the sunshine isn't flying in. It's very hard to see um, see dust motes, so I'm just kind of faking that. Um, yeah, if it's even necessary at this point, because it's going to be so little. Um, what was I going to say? They're so tiny. It, doesn't necessarily make sense. But now with those dust boats, what you could do is we could turn on rotation. We can randomize the rotation in two ways. And now it's just a case of scaling these down. And really all that's gonna do is if I just turn off my uh what do we call it my world shader here. Um There we go. And now you can see just these sort of tiny specks showing up and we can mess with the seed, we can add in more or less, but really it's just to add a little bit of imperfection to your render and it just makes it feel a little bit more grounded in reality, even though we're rendering something completely abstract. Well, let's see. I think I might wanna make the eyes glow a little bit more, but we can do that in just a bit. All right, let's hook this principal volume back up. Um, somebody's saying, can you use the object location to drive the noise texture and get the same result? Yeah, yeah, you probably could. I probably did it the long way around. Um, let's have a look real quick. So the randomness, you could use that to drive the location of the noise texture. Yeah, you could do the same thing. It it really doesn't matter. Yeah, but you could do that as well. So the particle system has this weird thing where when you turn on the collection of the particle, it disappears. Um, and then you kind of got to jiggle it a little bit to make it come back. It's annoying. It's an odd bug. Let me just have a look because I kind of like the seed where it was. So now you can see this is being broken up by these tiny little particles. Um, yeah, this has a little bit more going for it. So I would say we're getting pretty close to the end. I'm not, you know, I'm fairly happy with this. 
Let's see if I just move this over a little bit more just to give him a bit more space. And then that way there's no like negative space opening up. So it feels like he's melting into the side of the frame. Just feels like a bit more of a balanced composition. It's not the best thing ever, but it, it works in this particular case. This bit of negative space is unfortunate, but it's fine. Um, and again, it's just a case of looking at stuff and trying things out. I might just bring up the material on the wires, the thicker wires, just bring that back up a little bit. So there's slightly more going on and we see the that face showing up a little bit more. Okay, that's interesting. I guess we could deal with that. Um, let's turn on our emission so we can isolate those eyes really easily. Um, I'm just gonna turn on the emission um, pass. Yeah. Um, hmm. Let's see, let's see. I'm not sure about those eyes yet still. I don't know if I like that emission on them. I'm gonna find a way to make them more interesting without resorting to lighting them up. Turn off that subsurface and turn off metallic. Yeah, it's not really doing it for me. Drop in that color, set this to Christensen Burley. Okay, so that lights them up ever so slightly, and then just add a tiny bit of emission in there. It just flattens them out, but it gives us a little bit more. Let's see, let's look at this radius, because I'm sure if we make this a lot smaller, it's going to feel a little bit better. There we go. And then I could turn off the emission, or I could leave it if I really wanted to highlight the eyes. Is it really better? And then you do that and it looks awesome. Damn it. Yeah, maybe that does work. And then bringing down the volume a little bit more maybe, just to give it a bit more, a bit more contrast, make it a little bit more gritty. Yeah, for the sake of brevity, I'm gonna move on. Um, Cause I could do this stuff, I could tweak this stuff for a very long time. Maybe have the eyes more in the middle. What happens if I bring the camera down? Does that help? And he's a little bit far up the frame. No, okay, we got it. We got to stick with it, keep moving on. So let's do some final compositing. So they ended up being nice and emission y after all. Um, but I think that looks cool. So while it's rendering, it's time for some more uh, questions. What is your favorite AI tool right now? I don't really use any AI tools. I guess the, the super scale and resolve, <laughs> if that counts. But other than that, um, I'm not really using any of them right now. It's interesting, but I just haven't had the time to look into that stuff. Uh, I wonder if you can share how to make an iridescent shader with frost glass. Uh, the, yeah, that's going to be a lot to go into. So I would suggest looking for a tutorial, unfortunately. Um, but they're out there. You could also buy... Um, shaders on blender market and stuff that do that um but yeah i'm yeah i'm not gonna get into it I'm afraid. it's gonna take too long <laughs> so but basically frosted glass yeah you would mix you would layer them i would do the frosted glass separately and then layer the iridescent shader on top with something like a layer weight node and then have like yeah there is one i can show you one maybe that's a good uh, starting point. There is on the Blender Artists Forum, there's a really good iridescent shader. Um, it's free that somebody built. Uh, where is it? I'm just going to go to Blender Artists and then type it in. Let me make my browser a little bit bigger here. It's rendering so we can take our time. So, iridescence, C and C. I always forget how to spell it. I think it's iridescent. Uh, 
Where is it? I'm just going to go to Blender Artist Organ. I don't use it that much, so I might be doing something wrong with the search. Normally, when I search it, I can find it. So, Blender Artists, and then. Sent. Where is it? Where is it? This one, the thin film interference. That's what I was looking for. So this one originally there's, and you have to scroll down and there's like a version 2.2 or something is the final one. <clears throat> but this one has a whole bunch of like presets in it with iridescence. So you could use that one and, and layer it on top. I'll, uh, I'll drop it in here. <clears throat> You could layer it on top of a glass shader and then get that look. Um, but yeah, this one's pretty, pretty advanced. So uh, still rendering. So let's see. Um, mm -mm, I'm stunned by the fact that you've worked over an hour on live stream without saving your files once. That's courage. Well, Blender's pretty good. It's pretty stable. Um, the autosave is really good too. It auto saves every two minutes. So I'm not too worried even if I... Uh, even if I haven't saved it, I can usually recover it um, down to a point where I don't have to do that much or redo that much. Uh, my PC would have already crashed Blender 10 or 20 times. You might think so, but Blender can handle a surprising amount of geometry before uh, it run in, runs into issues. Even on lower spec machines, geometry really isn't that tough to deal with in general. If you have enough RAM, um, yeah, you'll uh, you'll have a good time. So. Uh, so let's see the way it was before was a lot better. I don't know when this was posted. I guess I was <laughs> messing with stuff, but, um, just going to skip over the stuff that was fine. Yeah. I'm surprised Blender can handle however so much geometry. Yeah, it is geometry. Like, what is it? Three and a half million polygons, something like that. It's very doable. So people are saying hi from everywhere. Hello. <laughs> um, did you discover any new artists that you would recommend to check? Um, mm, 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 trying to think if there's anybody I can immediately think of. Um, who was I looking at earlier? Uh, let's see. Let me open up my Firefox here. I'm just going to open it on a different window so I can search through my history. Um, so I kind of rediscovered uh, Russ. Kasanoff. Uh, where is he? So I'm just going to go to Ross Kasanoff because I've been doing a lot of um, macro experiments with film, like filming macro stuff. And he, he does a lot of really cool stuff like that as well. Um, so he's somebody I, I recently sort of re, re, I guess, yeah, found again. <laughs> That's the best way to look at it. That's cool. Uh, somebody I could recommend, I guess. Um, mm, 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 mm. So, how do you prefer a flat background on your humanoid works? Um, I'm usually just too lazy to make a background. <laughs> so, it's only preference. But generally, in portrait photography, you're not going to have too crazy of a background. Um, yeah. I'm kind of approaching it like a, like a portrait photographer, I guess. <clears throat> So, um, uh, something about the object location. Yeah, we went through that. Uh, love your style, contributing attitude to the community. Hey, happy to contribute. Um, so even easier is if you switch the noise to 40, you control that with the object info. Yeah. See, even quicker way to do it. Now I'm not going to change it because uh, then we have to re-render. I don't want to start finishing this up. Um, but we'll see. I don't know what my render settings are set to, but it seems to be going a little bit faster now. Um, do, 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 do. Seems my screen is dirty from the dust now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the screen, the, the dust. So it's a little, like you said, it's the little details that do go a long way. Um, do I ever share my project files? This one specifically I'll share as well once I'm done with it. Um, and I could, I guess I could upload it live and, and share it while I'm answering some questions towards the end. 
Um, do you often mess with multiple render delays and composite stuff together? Or do you just raw dog the camera output? Honestly, I prefer raw dogging the camera output because putting that stuff together again, whether it's in Blender or in a different package, is just time consuming. And I, uh, yeah, um, I'd prefer to do everything in camera if possible. Um, but yeah. And the thing is, this way I don't have to leave Blender. I can just keep going to the end, to the bitter end in Blender itself. Um, now for this one, I think I left the emission on. Yeah. So in this case specifically, because I just have those glowing eyes, it might be you nice to use it to kind of, um, yeah, separate it out. But even in general, I would just use a mask or something. It's just to save a little bit of time if we're going to end up doing something with it. So I want to have a bit more um, on the face here. So I'm going to put a big, big old vignette at the bottom. Um, but to do that, let's go to the mat and let's create an ellipse mask. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to multiply that in. And I should really learn the shortcuts for <laughs> Node Wrangler because I keep doing all this stuff by hand. I'm sure it can be done faster. So let's bring this up, move this up a little bit. Oh. And then let's rotate this. So I'm just using this because the blur filter, unfortunately, in the Blender compositor, even on a crazy machine, is just insanely slow, which is a shame. Um, so I can position this correctly before I blur it. Open filter, blur. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Then I set this to fast Gaussian, which is still not very fast. And if you set this to relative, now you're going to blur relative to the size of the image. So when I do a larger render later, uh, when I bump up the resolution, the, I know the blur down here is going to stay the same, which is kind of nice. So now um, we've got this going for us. And you can see immediately how it pulls the um, the face sort of out of the rest of the image. And it's a little bit dark. I might back this off a little bit. And again, this is all personal uh, stuff. Maybe if I make it a little bit bigger. It's a little bit softer, but it didn't quite work out there. Maybe bring it up a little bit, ever so slightly. There we go. Now we have a nice sort of flow going from the top of the bottom of the image. So it's cool. Um, yeah, I kind of like that. I'm digging this. I don't know if I do too much to this, honestly. It's quite interesting. Maybe move this over a little bit. So there's more darkness on the side of that face, even Just sliding it over. There we go. Now let me just look at the blur here and change the thing. Cause I really don't like that part that I was all about in the beginning. I really don't like that too much. So now we blur it out. This is going to blur out a little bit as well. Um, Maybe I'm overdoing it, overthinking it. It's okay. This is working against me now, but it's fine for the purposes of doing this live. Um, sometimes you just stick with what you've got. So, so if we can do any quick color correction. So I use the curves in here all the time because I know I'm just exporting my file from Blender. We just bring this out. Just tiny corrections. So just by taking the red out, the green looks a bit more interesting. Let's mess with this. Bring up the green a little bit. Not too much. We don't want it like completely green, but we want it to accentuate the rest. There we go. And then bringing the blue down, up. Again, just pushing it around just to see if mixing these channels gives us anything a bit more interesting. I don't know. I kind of like this the way it is. It's not perfect, but it'll do. For the purpose of demonstration, we could do one final glare maybe, but I've, yeah, I don't really use it that much anymore, I've noticed. So let's see um, if we just put in the glare and we set the mix to one, then we can actually see what the glare node is doing. And we can change the threshold and then we'll see maybe here is where, yeah, here is where that emission um, comes in. 
and that way we can just set it to one to zero or to point five. So in this case, that kind of helped. And I'm gonna set this to fog glow and the size to nine and just set the threshold to zero. So it just glows like crazy. And by having this glare separate, we can composite it over and we have more control over it. So I'm just gonna add that in. There we go. Now this is a case of toning it down to see. It's a little over the top, but it does just give you a little bit more to go on. And this turned out to be kind of fun. There we go. We could have a look at the streaks to see if they're more interesting. So um, rather than doing a glow, let's do streaks and let's just look at them separately. So we could modulate the color and that means it's gonna get like kind of weird RGB-ishness. Uh, we're gonna set the fade up pretty high. There we go. And then let's see when we mix that in, if it looks any good. It's cool. Let's add some more iterations so it's a little bit softer. There we go. And then what we could do is we could offset, use the angle offset to kind of have them pointing in a similar direction to the eyes. And that just gives it a little bit extra. There we go. Something like this maybe. Bring in the fade a little bit. Just a little bit of extra on the eyes. Again, it's all about subtle effects. And this is almost too much, I would say. So I'm gonna bring up the color modulation to see if that breaks it up. There we go. Let's take them away and add them. It's not much, but it does the trick. I don't know if the glow was better or not. Let's switch over. Yeah, I feel the glow is more subtle. I think I like that better. So let's stick with that. And then a final sort of thing that I do, but it's that's a very personal thing. I add two filter nodes at the end. Um, let's turn off the first one. And I'm going to set the first one to sharpen. Now, the only issue with that is that you can get these really nasty black edges around your highlights. Um, yeah, because of the way colors are, are being toned. And this is not a very HDR aware filter, but setting it fairly low just kind of helps. Let's see if we can see the difference. Sorry, I'm zooming in and out here. So this is with it, without it, and this is with it. Just brings out those details a little bit more. And then I kind of almost undo those with a soften. Um, because when you're taking pictures with something like a DSLR, nothing is really ever sharp. And um, I found as well, if I ever want to blow up this image, if I just want to make it like 10% or 20% bigger, if I'm printing it large format, um, then it really helps that it, uh, it has been like softened a little bit because then you won't see the, the, the digital nature of it as much. So if we just turn both of, both of those off, you can see the difference. It's very subtle, but for me personally, it just sort of takes the, the CG-ness of it out of it a little bit. So there we go. He's looking pretty badass. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I'm going to set the, how long does it, did this take to render? Seven minutes. Hmm, let's see. Can we bring down the noise threshold? Maybe the maximum samples. We'll do like a final render. I might bring this back up for the final render, but that way I can let it render again at larger, larger format and uh, answer some questions in the meantime. So it seems like somebody's uh, kicking up a fuss in the, in the chat there. I have no idea how did I deal with that. So I'm just gonna remove that because that's unnecessary. Sorry, I have to do my own moderation here. Uh, remove and then I'll uh, I'll answer the rest of the questions. So here we go. Um, do, 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 do. 
So let's see, where were we? Um, mm -mm. So that was the multiple vendor layers. Which distro I'm using? I'm using Void Linux. Um, yeah. So I use Void Linux with a GNOME desktop, uh, which I really like. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. So image, where would you recommend to start if you want to learn about motion graphics? Honestly, just start making stuff and start thinking about things you want to make with those skills. Um, the thing that I've always found is when people start uh, learning things and they don't have anything they want to use it for, then generally you kind of get stuck learning these techniques, but you never really apply them. And maybe it's a good thing to think about a project that you want to create with those skills and then go from there. That tends to help. So, um, do so let's see more people which Linux distro I just answered that one uh, how come ZBrush is able to hand more topology well because ZBrush was built from the, the ground up to handle lots and lots and lots of um, topology so <laughs> so let's see uh, how to start shading nodes training just mess with them start plugging stuff into one another. Um, there's a really good uh, procedural shading training course on the Blender Studio by one of the people that works on the films there, uh, Simon Thomes. So I would recommend looking into that one as well. Um, that's a good place to start, but he goes pretty fast. So yeah, there's some like advanced concepts in there that, that come out pretty quick. <laughs> so make sure you know what you're in for. Um, mm, so I have no idea what binod means. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, do, do, do. Macro stuff was really much. I've been enjoying that because it's nice to have something outside of 3D to, that's a bit more tangible. Um, yes, uh, Toxic Tuba, it was your comment that, that got me uh, looking at Rust's stuff because I'd looked at it before. And then um, I was talking to somebody about it recently and I couldn't remember the name. And then I noticed that you had commented it and I was happy to, to look it back, uh, uh, to find it again. So that was really nice. Thank you. Um, so. So Russ is the guy that we mentioned. Um, so, well, people are saying, nice stream. Well, thank you for joining. Uh, there is going to be a meetup in Antwerp the 20th of May. Uh, so mark that in your calendar. If you follow me, I'll tweet about it. Um, and the 13th of May, I'm going to open up a gallery show that's going to be running for two weeks. So anybody in and around uh, Antwerp is welcome to join 13th of May. It's a Friday evening and I'll be having, I'll have a whole bunch of physical works in a gallery. Um, more on that. If you follow me, I'll definitely, uh, definitely talk more about that. So, <laughs> so writing stone, I appreciate you mentioning the, the, the tutorial. Yeah. It's good when you, when you know a little bit of blender, I wouldn't recommend it for complete beginners. Um, Although I've heard people that have started with it and have been quite successful with it. Um, but I want to just make sure that I'm not, um, yeah, uh, recommending something which might not be feasible for something, somebody just starting. So um, keep that in mind. But yeah, I'm glad that you liked it. So that's good. So let's see, we're just waiting for a render now. But honestly, I think we can pretty much wrap it up here. It's been almost two hours. Uh, so yeah, that was kind of fun. Uh, let me know if you guys want to see more of this kind of stuff in the future. I don't mind at all. Um, yeah, it's interesting for me too. So i um, trying to think if there's anything else I need to mention. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't know. If there's any last questions, go for it. I'll happily answer them. And uh, if not, then we can kind of End it. <laughs> End it here, I guess. Awkward goodbyes. <laughs> so.
this bad boy render. And yeah, I'll uh, I'll provide all the um, all the files and stuff in the description. Once I've uploaded it, once I've let this render out, I'll uh, I'll do like a nice big version and throw it in there. So cool. I want to see as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I need to find the time to stream a little bit more because I do enjoy it, but I just need to make sure that. Yeah, I always feel like I'm repeating myself because I use a lot of the same techniques over and over again, maybe in different ways and stuff. But I just want to make sure that I'm not like just doing the same thing over and over because that doesn't really, it's not really useful for anyone, I think. So cool. So I'm seeing a few people answering uh, that they like them and I could do more. All right. Yes. Cool. So I think I've I've ranted enough. I'll um, end the stream here. So thank you again for joining all of you. I have no idea because every time I, yeah, I'm terrible at streaming. So I never know when I hit end if it actually gets the right part or not. But, um, oh, there's some questions coming in so quickly. Is there a reason why you render things as one big tile? I think it's faster when you change the tile size, by the way. Um, yeah, I prefer to see the entire image at once. So that's, um, yeah, that's definitely a thing. I just prefer to see the full thing, honestly. Um, I can judge a noisy image a lot better than a part of it. So now that we have that functionality, I'm going to use it all day, every day. For a final render, if I'm running out of um, memory, I might turn it on. But other than that, I don't really bother with it too much. So it's mostly for like preview renders that it's disabled. Um, am I planning on doing a tutorial for the macro photography stuff? I would love to, but I just need to figure out how to do that. Because I would love to do a live stream where you can watch me film it where you can see the output of the camera and I can stream it in. So that'd be cool. Um, but yeah, we'll see. And then let's see. You've worked on flower pigmentation, like patterns, form. I Not really, honestly. So sorry. Um, but yeah. All right. I think I'll, uh, yeah, definitely end it here. So thank you everybody for joining. <laughs> have, a, have a lovely weekend. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Goodbye. <laughs>